Welcome back to Acer P Bonsai. I'm Pat, and we're here with my sumo style Kiyohime Pre Bonsai. As you can see, we're at the beginning of June, and the tree has fully hardened off. The leaves are turning into that nice dark hunter green color. There's a few over here that have a little bit of discoloration. I see a little bit of thrip damage on some of the tips. But as we discussed, we did that early spring pinch back to help distribute the energy on this tree, and it did have the desired result. Some of these laggers continue to grow. There's a few around here in the back as well that pushed a little bit more, so it was a successful operation. But now that we are in the beginning of summer, the first week of June, it is time to do defoliation on this tree. Defoliation has become somewhat of a contentious topic in the world of bonsai. Bonsai professionals will tell hobbyists it's never a good idea to do a full 100% defoliation on a Japanese maple. I believe that that line of thinking comes from the fact that older Japanese maples tend to weaken with age, especially as they get into the really refined state. If you do a full defoliation on a refined Japanese maple, you're likely to weaken the tree further and you could also risk losing some branches. With this tree, even though it looks quite full on camera, this is in the very early stages of development. We've got it in an oversized pot, we've fertilized it heavily, it pushed really well in spring. We in fact had to pinch it back a bit to control that growth. And we know that this tree is in a strong state of health and it can handle the defoliation operation. Before I move to a time lapse, let's come on in close and look at a few of the different types of defoliation that we'll have in our arsenal when working on our different trees. Here we are at the canopy of the tree. And although some of these shoots are extended multiple nodes, I want to demonstrate a few of the different defoliation techniques. As you can see here, it has been pinched back. You can actually see the terminus of the shoot there, and then you can see two small buds at the base of the leaf. When you see these buds, that's also a really good indication that you have a strong tree, and that lets you know that you're ready for the defoliation process. But if this was a more mature tree and we didn't want to do a full defoliation, we might do a partial defoliation. When we do a partial defoliation, we're going to remove one leaf from each pair of leaves. Maple leaves orient themselves in an opposite leaf pattern. What that means is that at each node, there will be two leaves coming out on opposite sides of the stem. And then when you go further down the tree, you'll notice that the next pair of leaves down, they're gonna also be a pair that are opposite each other. It's kind of hard to see here, but if you notice this end pair is actually up and down in orientation, and then this pair in here is lateral in orientation. So when you're working with Japanese maples, this opposite pattern is going to not only have two leaves at every node, it's also going to have each pair of nodes oriented at 90 degrees from each other. Let's pretend that this branch here was only extended by say two nodes. We're worried about the overall mass of the leaves shading out the interior of the tree. So for these, what we would do is we would pick which leaf we wanted to keep from each pair. This one here seems to be slightly smaller than this one. The second part of that is this leaf here seems to be in a nice open space. So I would go in and I would cut the leaf at the petiole. The petiole is this little stem here. It's part of the leaf and it connects the palm of the leaf to the stem. The reason we cut on the petiole is because there's a natural compartmentalization at the base of the petiole. So if any kind of bacteria gets into the stem, you shouldn't have much worry that it could enter the vascular system. So we always cut at the petiole and we allow these half petioles here to die back and they'll fall off naturally in about a week or two. Now, not only did I cut off the larger leaf, I was actually thinking a little bit more strategically as well. Further back on the stem, we have this leaf here, and then we have this interior leaf. I didn't say it on camera, but I also chose this leaf to remove because I knew I'd want to remove this inner leaf. The reason I'm removing this inner leaf is because it's all down in here congested with all these other leaves. If able, we always want to be able to choose the leaf that will give us the most open pattern of leaves. This would be your standard partial defoliation. This first type of partial defoliation is called haskashi or hasukashi would be kind of the American way of pronouncing it. And that's when you remove the smaller leaf from one of each of the pairs, hasukashi. In addition to a standard partial defoliation, sometimes bonsai artists will recommend doing partial outer canopy defoliation, in which case they might reduce the leaves like this, removing one leaf from every pair, and they may also reduce these further, or they may even reduce them all the way 
but leave some of the leaves on the interior and never fully defoliate the interior leaves. It's gonna allow more sunlight into the interior leaves and that's gonna strengthen those smaller shoots that will become the future branches of the tree. So there's our demonstration on standard partial defoliation, removing one leaf from each pair along the stem. If you've gone over the entire tree doing the partial defoliation and still leaves you with a high amount of density, you can further reduce the size of each of these leaves. The next type of partial defoliation is called hagiri. And hagiri is when you reduce the size of the leaf itself. One of the popular methods of doing that is to just simply cut the side lobes off of a leaf and you can leave the stronger center lobe like that. And it kind of creates an interesting look. So let's perform hagiri on this one as well. Or kind of the more Americanized pronunciation, hagiri. H-A-G-I-R-I. -I. So we'll do hagiri on this one, and there we go. We would have done a partial defoliation through hashkashi, and then we also performed hagiri to reduce the leaves even further. Usually on these dwarf cultivars with the iroha uh, momiji leaf shape, you don't really have to do both. Usually just doing the hashkashi is enough to thin the foliage enough on this. When you're working with an amawinum style leaf or a matsumuri style leaf, which are larger, then you may need to do the combination of hashkashi as well as hagiri. So this was just for demonstration purposes. On this tree today, we're actually going to be doing a full defoliation, so these can go as well. So for this highly vigorous tree in the developmental phase, we're going to perform a full defoliation. We want this tree to produce two years of ramification in one growing season. We're gonna get in here and we're just gonna start trimming these leaves away. The other reason we're gonna perform this full defoliation, it's gonna allow us to take a look at the structure of the tree, assess our wounds, see if we need to make any adjustments, and then also we can do a little bit of selective pruning if necessary. I'm gonna to move to a time lapse and we're going to fully defoliate this tree. Before I remove these final leaves, I wanted to take a moment to demonstrate a few other versions of the Hagiri technique. Uh, when you're cutting those leaves down, you can do it in a few different ways. I also wanted to take the opportunity to show you what it looks like when we get false leaves. And these are the sepals of uh, the new shoots. A sepal is a small sheath that can sometimes take the form of a leaf. They're just a protective sheath that covers a new bud as it emerges out into a shoot into the spring. So I'm gonna come in close. I'm gonna show you the sepals or the, I believe the Japanese call them susa buds. Uh, if you're looking at those videos that talk about alternating leaf pattern deciduous trees, they always talk about that susa bud, which is that first leaf. So when you're doing your alternating, we always keep two true leaves uh, to increase ramification and we always wanna make sure we're not counting that susa bud or that sepal. If we cut above the sepal versus above the first true node, there's a likelihood that we wouldn't get the budding and the ramification that we desire when we're developing our bonsai. So let's take a closer look. Back here, we have a true leaf. You can see the petiole here. It actually is emerging from the backside of this branch. And then these other two leaves here, these are actually sepals. The anatomy that we're looking for when we're identifying sepals is that they come straight from the base in the area where it should have a petiole, which is that stalk of the leaf. And it has a very flat leaf-like structure. There's another sepal on this side. Let me pull that back and you can see that shiny spot there in the center of that leaf-like stem. So that's how you tell. You're looking for those flattened areas in the spot where there should be a petiole. And they come from the very base of a new shoot. So these are sepals, these are susa buds. Although buds will not form at the base of these sepals, it's always possible to get new budding down below that. So if this first node extends too far and you decide I need to cut that back, even though there won't be buds at the base of the susa or the sepals, you can still expect back budding to occur at that original node that the shoot came from. So oftentimes when we're doing defoliation, we'll remove additional shoots because those nodes are too long and that's okay too but for the purposes of today all we're going to do is remove those susa we're going to remove those sepals just like that and then here we have one additional leaf i think i'm probably going to remove this shoot it's unneeded 
uh, in that location, but I wanted to demonstrate another way we can do hagiri on the tree or hagiri on the tree. So the first demonstration I showed you, you could keep that center lobe of the leaf. The second method, if you fold the leaf over in half, you can then cut it diagonally and that will give you an open shape like that. So this is a bit smaller on this tiny leaf. This leaf was really small and it ended up giving us something really, really tiny. Down here, you can see another leaf. So let me show you another way versus the fold technique. You can also keep kind of the meat of the hand and you can just come along here and you can cut all of the lobes or fingers of the leaf off. And that will leave you with something more like that. So there's another Hagiri method there. All right, we've got this leaf as well. Now we are gonna to try to get this to bud, so I'm just going to remove those, bye. All right, so let me remove the last few leaves here. Let's remove these over here. This is a brand new shoot that emerged from the trunk itself. So we're gonna want this to gain a little bit of size. We're probably gonna throw a little bit of wire on this. I have read in forums that these Kiyohime Japanese maples tend to have a harder time back budding. Personally, I've never experienced an issue with that. And I think that that's because I make sure the tree is well fertilized and growing strong before I do any of these techniques on it. In addition to creating two years worth of ramification, we also defoliate to give ourselves a better look at the interior of the tree during midsummer. I believe we discussed in one of the previous episodes, oh, this is a really interesting little shoot here. Let's zoom in close and take a look at it. On this side, we have what appears to be a sepal. Very interesting. But on the opposite side, we have what appears to be a true leaf. If it decides to bud, that's great. When you're working on your own trees at home, you may be in a little bit more of a hurry. Um, for demonstration purposes, I individually cut all of these leaves off the tree. Now, if you know you're gonna cut back to one node, you can also grab the entire shoot, imagining if it had leaves on it, and let's say we were gonna cut back to this. You can see that there would have been leaves here and here. You can actually grab those leaves and fold them against the stem, and then you can cut through both leaves as well as the stem at the same time. And that'll save you a little bit of time. You can see that we allowed several nodes to grow on most of these branches. We're in an intermediate phase of development, so we didn't want to pinch in the spring and really control that growth. We wanted a moderate amount of growth, so we allowed them to run but we did manage that growth in early spring to make sure that they weren't extending too far. We didn't want any part of the tree to become too strong. Most of these we're gonna cut back to just one node. In addition to the defoliation, cutting these shoots back is gonna give the tree that additional signal that's gonna say, hey, a lot of my branches just got messed with here by an animal. That's me, the human, I guess, is the animal in this situation. It's a time to push out a new set of leaves We've got a lot more photosynthesis to do this year. So that's the basis of my technique. Generally, defoliating is enough to cause that second flush. Cutting the stems back as well is gonna put the tree into alarm mode, which means it's gonna to try to grow new branches. And that's gonna give you a high probability of getting additional back budding back on the trunk. Now that we have all the leaves removed, we can also see the work we did in the early spring. We can assess all these wounds, see how they're healing. So I'm gonna come in close and let's take a look at a few of these larger wounds that we worked on in the springtime. We have this nice powerful branch that we chop back. You don't see any healing here because the tree is going to sacrifice the rest of this branch. So there's about a half a centimeter to a centimeter of nub left here before you reach this farthest branch. All right, our big chop. You can see that there's a crack in our clay and that's a really good indication during the growing season. When you see that crack, you know that the wound is healing. And you can see we've got that really nice callus forming around the perimeter. It helps to have a little bit of water in your fingers when you're working with this cut putty. All right, we don't need to peel that all the way back, but we do wanna make sure that we're getting callusing all the way around the perimeter. We do have a little bit of blackening there, but that's nothing to be too concerned about. This is healing nicely. We have a healing line all the way around the perimeter here. Here's our next wound. And as you can see, this one is also healing quite well. That's about doubled the size of the callus since spring, so that's great. This is that lower branch that we did a fair amount of carving on in the spring. And as you can see, it is healing pretty well. There's not much of callus growing here at the base. I see a little bit of sap build up there. That is going to continue healing nicely. After finding that pussy wound on my first 
Momiji, it's lit the flame under my butt to make sure I'm checking these and making sure that I have a good seal on those open cuts. The putty on the bottom here is drying out, but look at there, beautiful callus forming there. We are over halfway to covering that wound over. Got a little bit of fresh putty. I'm gonna make sure that I pack that in there nice and tight. This was a fairly large semi-flat cut, so this may not give us the finished shape we want on this branch. I didn't want to cut it any further and risk killing the branch. After this wound fully closes, we may come back in here and re-excavate this side to create a little bit better branch shape. You can already see here that this wound is closing nicely. We don't need to open that up. I'm going to go ahead and cut most of these branches back to one node. Okay, so here's the tree after reducing most branches back to one node. Let's do a full 360. You will notice that in a few locations, like right here, I've left the entire, I may cut off just that tip to encourage the back budding. So in a few areas of the tree, I kept more than just the one node. Here's an example right here. I've got this branch. I kept two nodes because I want to add another secondary. Well, I guess let's see. This is a primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. I guess we're gonna add another quaternary branch. And since this branch back here is already quite thick, I wanted to allow two nodes of growth to give this a little bit more opportunity to thicken up. I'm gonna bring you in close so that you can follow along as we wire a few of these younger branches. So here's that quaternary branch that we wanna continue developing. We allowed two nodes to extend, and we're hoping that we'll get branching at both of these when this tree starts to push. This little branch is really well positioned. It's oriented really close to this other quaternary branch here, so it's gonna create a really nice natural appearance. Let's wire that up. First, I'm going to anchor my wire to this stronger branch, like so. It's fairly loosely wrapped, but we do want it to be stable. And then I'm gonna come around here and over the top of this branch. And since we're gonna be heading into the autumn season with leaves on this tree, I won't be able to see what's going on here. So I am going to maintain a really nice loose wrap on this branch. Even with this silicone wrapped aluminum, we wanna make sure that this branch has room to breathe. We wanna minimize the chance of wire scarring on this young, delicate branch. So as you can see, we have a nice open coil and we're going to gently bend that branch out to fill out the pad of this branch. Moving around to the side, here's another branch that I allowed to extend. It has one, two, three, four nodes, and I didn't trim it at all. At first glance, you might consider this branch to be a structural flaw. As you can see, it's emerging from the same node line as this other lateral branch. This one's already pretty well developed. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and we're gonna have our quaternary branching after this defoliation. This branch back here is a brand new one emerging from that node line. This may seem like a structural flaw, but because this trunk is so thick, it's gonna look just fine. It's gonna look quite natural and it's not gonna cause any taper problems. You can also see we've got this large knob here. We're gonna to have to remove that as well. But first I want to wire this branch and put some movement into it. This large trunk is not gonna grow significantly through the autumn season. So it's gonna make a great anchoring point for our wire. While we wrap this gentle coil, we're trying to avoid making contact where the buds emerge from the branch. We wanna allow those the maximum opportunity to grow and thrive. Again, we're gonna do a nice open coil so that we don't interrupt the thickening of this branch during the autumn season. There we go. And when we bend this branch, our goal is to introduce gentle movement while also considering the overall balance of the tree. So we're gonna bend it slightly to the right, and then I'm gonna curve it this way. Just a nice, gentle movement. Nothing difficult here. We just want to add a little bit of interest and movement to this branch, and we may end up cutting a lot of it back in the future, but while we have this elongation, we want it to match the character and age of the rest of the tree. A little bit higher, you can see that we have these branches coming back down here. Those come off of this upper branch. We chopped this branch back here. It had a really long extension that came out way off screen a few years ago. And so we've allowed this one to grow quite a bit. I've got it just tucked underneath this wire here. But first, let's see if this branch is maintaining its position. 
So we're going to undo this wire here and see if it holds its shape. There you go. As you can see, it moved only a fraction of a centimeter. So this branch is now in place. It's stable. We got a nice curve into it to put it in the position we wanted. And now we need to move this little baby branch. This branch here is a good example, or maybe a bad example is a better way to say it, of a slingshot branch because this branch emerged really sharply out of this side of the branch. We bent it this way. This one came straight out that direction there, direction of the wire, and we've slowly been bending it around. Because it's so young, I am going to try my best to bend it really sharply forward and over time, we can get rid of that slingshot shape. If at the end of a few years of growing, it just doesn't work out, we can always reduce this branch off. First, we're gonna anchor our wire on its sister branch here. Come up and over the top. Langley jets are flying today, so excuse the extra background noise, folks. I'm just going to do a nice gentle coil as we did before. And now that I have this wired over, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce this upper branch and start working on that ramification now. We're going to maintain the full length of this lower branch and we'll start building our new branch from that. Got it into a nice open position. From the top view, these branches are not really in the way. It's got its little space there and we'll continue to do some directional pruning to build this branch out in the future. What I am going to do is I'm going to nip off just that tip to encourage back budding. Get around to the other side. We have this branch here, another one emerging from one of those primary branches. Let's get a wire on that. So we're going to anchor around the back side of this sub trunk. We're going to apply our nice open coil. All right, more or less a little S shape. We may not keep this entire branch as before, but we want to introduce a little bit of movement, give it that more aged natural appearance. All right, so that branch fits in nicely to the design. We've got another branch back here, and we definitely need to crank this one down into position. As you can see, this branch here has a really long internode. It's about an inch and a half to two inches. That may need to go in the future. So we are gonna start building this branch here. So right here we have a pair of young branches, one here and one here. Let's wire these up as battle buddies and get them into a nice position. There's a nub here, I'm gonna go around the bottom of that. Come up through here to access this upper branch. We need this branch to come out to the front. Nice open coil. Let's see if we can bend this really sharply without breaking it. This midsummer period gives you some of the most flexible branches compared to any other time of the year. If you can get in under these leaves, it's a great time to do some of this wiring. I think it looks pretty good. And then we have this other branch here, also looks good. We don't want to make the tree overly contrived with excessive wiring. We just want to control a little bit of what's going on. This branch here, we allowed a couple nodes to grow because it is so small. We want that to develop. 
I actually do want to move this around just slightly over into this position. Give this one a little bit of breathing room. So let's wire this branch here. All right. This branch has a little bit more natural interest to it. It already has one area of ramification. So I want to select to put my wire line out onto the less interesting branch. And that's going to be this branch on your right. Bend work back here on the base of this branch. That's holding nicely. I think we can bend this branch a little bit. Sorry for the jet. I'm going to use that wire to just bend this branch slightly out here toward the front. Give it a little space away from this trunk. All right, we've got this one bent. We bent it over to the left. And then we are going to bend this other branch down and away. And then we'll continue that motion back over to the left. Now I'm gonna make a double use of this wire. On this right-hand side branch, I did a curve that way and then left. I'm gonna use the tip of this wire here to hook the tip of this branch. And I'm gonna bring that slightly back over to the right and that's going to create a more acute angle between these two branches and give it slightly more of a natural look. We don't know what we're going to do with this little branch here. For now we're just going to leave it. Maybe it'll grow and we can add another branch. But it may in the future kind of conflict with this little side branch. We'll see what we can do. Maybe we drop it down and create something interesting. But for now we've got this little guy in a nice position. It's given itself a little bit of room from this and it's in its own open space. It's gonna create a nice small branch and it's far enough back that it's not gonna overshadow the branch below it. The only other thing I wanted to do on this tree is address this monster branch right here. I cut this off the first winter I owned the tree, leaving a large nub. That must have been spring of 2022. And it has died back a little on this right-hand side. The left-hand side healed over quite nicely. We've given this plenty of time to compartmentalize and it's time to cut this back. Okay, we're gonna start this work with our knob cutters. It's a huge branch, but our goal here is to just slowly nibble this back. Isn't that amazing that this calloused right over the top of a flat cut? Small cuts. We do need to bring it down enough that we don't end up with inverse taper. Let's get in there with our favorite tool, a brand new clean razor blade. Clean up the edges here. We want to make sure we remove any of that tissue that got crushed by our bonsai tools. But no matter how sharp they are, they're going to cause a little bit of damage. We're using this brand new razor blade, we know it's clean, we know it's sharp. Nice, slow, patient cuts. So when we're putting the weight on this blade and we're slicing, I'm slicing down and toward the midpoint of that cut. If I, if I slice away from the cut, it can lift up this cambium tissue and cause additional separation damage. So I'm always doing my major slice in the inward direction toward that center of that cut. Gotta be really careful with these razor blades. Don't want to accidentally slice the branch off. There's one little tight spot that was hard to get. We're going to be satisfied with what we got before it sits open too long. We're going to go ahead and cover that over. Remember, this is the first cut. You can always come back in here, reassess this wound in the future. Always room to refine. We have another stub here that we need to deal with. Midsummer is our best opportunity to cut this back. I'm gonna leave a little bit of a nub. Nibble that away just a little bit more. All right, get back in here with our razor blade. Try 
trying our best to saw toward the center of the cut. Got a little bit of rot in the heartwood of this branch. That's okay. We've got several layers of healthy xylem here. So we have nothing to be worried about. We don't want to overly work the tree and we're in no hurry. We have five to ten years before this branch needs to be perfect. We're going to cover that up with a new, nice new layer of cut paste. All right, let's do another nice rotation around the tree. Looks like we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight branches wired. So that's pretty good. We defoliated the tree in about 10 to 14 days. We will have a new flush of leaves. Depending on how hard they push, I may pinch the second flush to keep it small. In a few of these branches we have in development, I'm hoping that they grow strongly and we can allow those to run. By pinching most of the canopy of the tree, we're going to allow this to push all of its energy into these young shoots that we're trying to grow into future branches. Because these branches were hiding under a dense canopy of leaves, we know that they are now very sensitive to the heat and the sun. We're going to move it into a shady location for the next five to seven days to allow its branches to acclimate to the higher light conditions. I'll be back in a few weeks after this tree pushes growth so you can see the results of our defoliation. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Acer P Bonsai. Hop into the comments section, let me know what you think, or bring me any of your questions. Just let me know what's going on in your Japanese maple garden. Have a great day.